A few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to go to Nashville, Tennessee, to the Pennington Bend Church of Christ and celebrate a 50-year reunion celebration for the Future Preacher Training Camp that was hosted there. And that congregation is growing very elderly, and uh, there is a distinct possibility that, that it will close its doors within the next few years, which is very sad. But while we were there, uh, we had an opportunity to go through the building and find uh, as much memorabilia from camp as we could. And wouldn't you know, that there was a cassette tape in that building with my name on it, the first sermon I ever preached. And I can't tell you what was in that sermon. It was just over 10 minutes long, and it was about saints or sanctification. That topic was assigned to me. And I did not keep the tape. I gave it to a brother who's going to have it digitized. So I haven't listened to it yet. And I don't know what I said. I probably don't want to know. (laughs) But this morning, we're looking at the church's first sermon. The sermon that was preached on the day of Pentecost when Peter stood up before those who were present and proclaimed the gospel by the power of the Holy Spirit for the very first time. And we've been leading up to this moment for several weeks now in our study of the book of Acts as we consider the way that the first Christians applied the life and teaching of Jesus to the life and teaching of the church. And that is embodied here in this first sermon that's recorded in Acts chapter 2, verses 14 through 41. And as we look at this sermon this morning, I want to notice three aspects of the sermon that Peter preached, the first gospel sermon we've often called it. And as we look at these three aspects of this sermon, we're going to do two things. We're going to look at the kind of preaching that we should expect in the church. If this preaching that Peter presented on the day of Pentecost was sufficient and more than sufficient, we may say, for the establishment of God's church, then ought this same kind of preaching not be what we should expect in the Lord's church today. But second of all, and just as important, is as we look at Peter's sermon and the three aspects of it, we are also looking at the kinds of sermon or the aspects of sermon that our life ought to preach to the people around us. So I want you to notice with me, first of all, in Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 14, that Peter's sermon was a Spirit-filled sermon. It was a Spirit-filled sermon. And that's true for at least two reasons. But before we talk about those reasons, let's read Acts chapter 2, verses 14 and following. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Now he's addressing those who have accused himself and the other apostles of being drunk with wine because they were speaking in languages that they had not studied. And so Peter answers them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day, that is 9 a.m., But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male and female servants in those days I will pour out my Spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now this is a spirit-filled sermon for two reasons. And the first reason is what Peter announces in these first verses that we read, and that is that he and the other apostles were not drunk, but were filled with the Holy Spirit. As we observed last week in our study of verses 1-13 through of this chapter, the Holy Spirit came upon Peter and the other apostles in a magnificent, observable manner. And so now Peter says, we're not drunk, 
We're filled with the Spirit. And so the message came not from a place of drunkenness, the result of which would be nonsense, but it came from the Holy Spirit of God. And therefore what Peter has to say in these verses and the verses that follow are of the utmost importance. If the source had been drunkenness, they would have been meaningless words. If the source had been even human wisdom or philosophy, they would not have carried the weight that they did. But because what Peter had to say on this occasion came from the Holy Spirit of God, what he had to say was of utmost importance. But also the sermon is a Spirit-filled sermon because of Peter's use of the prophecy in the book of Joel that we just read. Now, here's something that we may not know or may not think about when we read this account. But we mentioned last week that all of this is taking place on the day of Pentecost. Now, it's not called Pentecost in the Old Testament, but in Exodus and in Deuteronomy, it is referred to as the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Booths, or even the Feast of Sheaves. And in the present day, when Jews observe this holiday, they read from the Old Testament book, of Ruth. Because when you read the Old Testament book of Ruth, one of the primary settings in that book is in the field bringing in the crops. And so uh, from a standpoint of the seasons and the events that take place in Ruth, and the seasons and the events taking place originally around the Feast of Booths, these line up together. But this is the fascinating truth about Peter's use of the prophet Joel. The book of Joel and all of its prophecies refer throughout to locusts infesting the fields of God's people. And so it would have been highly inappropriate and ironic for Peter to stand up on the day of Pentecost and to proclaim a message from the prophet Joel. You can imagine he had the people's attention because they were not expecting a message like this. But it was the message that the people needed. Because this prophecy from Joel refers to the coming Christ and all that would be accomplished because of His work. And so we see there the references to the Spirit being poured out on all people on men and women, old and young, and on the signs and wonders that would be done. And we understand when we look at the account here in Acts chapter 2 that the prophecy from Joel is not completely fulfilled in this one moment on the day of Pentecost. But as we continue to look through the book of Acts, we will find that much of what is described in this prophecy is also described in the record of the book of Acts. For example, we find that Philip had daughters who prophesied, which is in fulfillment of this very passage. We understand that when God destroyed Jerusalem by use of the Roman army, that what is described here about the signs, blood and fire and vapor of smoke, uh, those were cataclysmic things, a representation of the destruction of Jerusalem. And so all of what is described here begins to be fulfilled on this day and continues to be fulfilled in the first generation of the church. And so Peter proclaims a spirit-filled sermon It is a Spirit-filled sermon first because Peter himself was filled with the Spirit and not with wine. Paul says in Ephesians 5.18, Do not be drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Christians are called to be filled with the Spirit as well. We'll talk in a moment about how that is. But also it is a Spirit-filled sermon because Peter refers to a prophecy from the Holy Spirit in which the very events we see are taking place. Now, if this sermon was a Spirit-filled sermon, ought we not expect in the Lord's church today that sermons should be Spirit-filled as well? Yet at the same time, we just said, we understand, according to the book of Acts, that the Spirit does not fall on people the same way that He fell upon Peter and the other apostles on this occasion. 
In fact, we only find two times in the book of Acts that we have this kind of event. In Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 10. And when Peter describes what happens in Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 11, he says it happened to them just as it happened to us at the beginning. But we know that that was a special occasion. And yet, Paul can say in Ephesians 5, Christians ought to be filled with the Spirit. And so how can we be people who are full of the Spirit today? Well, first of all, when we get to the latter part of the sermon, we find that those who obey the gospel receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That is, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit, pronounced before God as His children, announced in heaven that we belong to Him, just like a wax seal on a letter, bearing authority and identity in Christ because of the seal of the Spirit. But also... When we become Christians and we are sealed with the Spirit, we are to bear the Spirit's fruit that Paul describes in the book of Galatians. Love and joy and peace and patience and kindness. All of those attributes of God we ought to bear. And so, finally then, we also understand that this book that we have now, whether we're talking about the Old Testament or the New Testament, Paul says in 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for doctrine, that is teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped unto every good work. So how is it that sermons today ought to be full of the Spirit? Well, they ought to be proclaimed by people who belong to God in Jesus Christ and have been filled with the Spirit by obeying the Gospel, bearing His seal, and bearing His fruit. But they also ought to be proclaimed solely from this book. If the source is any other source, they will not have the desired effect. And so you, you've got to ask first, and this is an indictment upon me, <laughs> in the place where you worship on a regular basis, are the sermons full of the Spirit? And if they are not, what needs to change? But then second, does the life that you live preach? Spirit-filled sermons to those who are around you. If God desired the first sermon in His church to be a Spirit-filled sermon, it would seem that He desires all sermons in His church to be full of the Spirit. Second of all, notice that Peter's sermon was not only full of the Spirit, but it was a sermon that centered upon Christ in the verses that follow, Peter takes this opportunity to explain in several different ways how Jesus is the fulfillment of the Messianic prophecies of the Old Testament. And I'm not going to read all of those verses, but I want you to notice four items that Peter points to in these verses to explain how Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Old Testament. Verse 22, he tells us that Jesus was proven or attested by miraculous signs. Verse 23, he tells us that what Jesus did, especially in His death, was a fulfillment of God's plan from the beginning. Jesus did not fail and therefore go to plan B and die on the cross. It was God's plan from the very beginning for His Son to bear the sins of the world. That's your sins and mine. Then verses 24 through 29, He tells us that God raised Jesus from the dead and therefore set Him apart from all other prophets, including David. And then verses 30 through 36, having done all of this, Jesus is now seated on David's throne and has been exalted as both Lord, that is Master, and as Christ, that is Anointed One. And so in these verses, Peter makes it very plain, plain who Jesus is according to the prophecies of the Old Testament. Now once again, this is a message that was needed for the people. They might have expected a sermon, if they were going to get one on Pentecost, from a book like Ruth, but instead they got one about Jesus. You see, it doesn't matter what the occasion is. Whatever holiday may be celebrated in the world or even among those who call themselves Christian, Christian, 
it is always appropriate and needed to proclaim the gospel. You and I need it just as much as those on Pentecost needed it 2,000 years ago. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, And when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Every sermon, no matter the occasion, the date on the calendar, or the expectation of those present, should find its way to the greatest and most pressing message of all, the gospel message. And isn't it good news? Good news that God sent His Son to do for you and for me what we could not do for ourselves. It never grows tired. Do you ever tire of hearing what God has done for you in Christ? It never grows outdated. It does not matter what the major philosophy of the day is. It does not matter what political group is in power, what country we hail from, or what country we live in. None of those things matter. didn't matter on the day of Pentecost. There were Jews present from all over the known world. What mattered was they all needed to hear the message of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And it's a message that you and I need daily. And so we again ask ourselves the same two questions that we asked at the beginning. First, the messages that you hear on a regular basis from this pulpit, do they always get back to Christ? Now I've got to ask myself that question as well. But second of all, does your life Daily point others to Christ. And that means living the way that Christ did. Crucifying self. Giving up my wants and my needs so that I can better serve others. Not living according to the flesh, but living according to the Spirit. Does my life preach a message daily about Christ? As we look at the church's first sermon, we see it was a Spirit-filled sermon. It was also a Christ-centered sermon. And because it was a Spirit-filled sermon, and because it was a Christ-filled sermon, it was a heart-piercing sermon. Look at verses 37-41. through 41. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to Himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. You notice that Peter's sermon had a desired effect. And that effect was the touching of the heart. The sermon was not merely an emotional appeal. Peter did not stand up and preach to make people feel bad about themselves or good about themselves. He did not preach to stroke their egos or tickle their fancies. Frank read for us there from 2 Timothy chapter 4, which says in the latter days people will have itching ears. They want to hear things that make them feel good. But Peter did not stand up to make people feel bad or good. He stood up to touch their hearts to reach into their consciences. His sermon was not an emotional appeal, nor was it an intellectual appeal. Peter did not stand up merely to teach and preach some academic lesson. Well, let me explain to you exactly how Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. He did show how Jesus was the fulfillment of those promises, but it was not an academic exercise. The purpose was to touch the hearts of those who were present. And it produced a response. 
we're told about 3,000 souls were added that day to the Lord's body. Let me tell you, this is the prayer of all preachers. That their message would not step on toes, would not have people leaving saying, I know more than I knew before I walked into the building. The prayer of all preachers is to touch the hearts of those present with the Word of God so that they respond not to the sermon, but to God and what He has done in Jesus Christ. Now what we see, not only is that, G- that Peter's sermon touches hearts, but in touching hearts, Peter defines the appropriate response in verse 38. That when a heart is touched by the gospel, the response is to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. That is the response. It was the response on the day the church began and it ought to be the response today. And any other response falls short of what God has revealed in His Word. Repent and be baptized. And He doesn't say some of you. He says each one of you for the forgiveness of your sins. But then notice one more item here in verse 40. Peter was led by the Holy Spirit. He proclaimed a Christ-centered message that touched hearts. And he knew, he knew that he had reached the people and he did not give up, but continued, verse 40, to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. He was persistent in the proclaiming of this heart-touching message. He was not satisfied with one response or two, but wanted all who were present to respond. Paul tells us the glory of this message in in Romans 5, 8, and 9. God shows His love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not just for a few who were present, but for all who would respond. Since therefore we have now been justified by His blood, how much more shall we be saved by Him from the wrath of God? Peter says, turn from this crooked generation and save yourselves. Not because the saving work is in us, but the saving work has been done in Christ, thank God, because we couldn't do it. But we still have to respond to it. The message can be Spirit-filled and Christ-centered, but the response falls upon those who are present. You must choose today whether you will respond to a Spirit-filled, Christ-centered message. I'm not going to stand here and say, I've got it right. That's for you to determine. But Hebrews 4.12 says that the Word of God is living and active. That it divides the joints from the marrow. God sees you where you are and His Word touches you where you are. But it is upon you to save yourself from this crooked generation by embracing the gift that He has made available to you in Jesus Christ. That opportunity is available to you today. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, You can respond just like those present on the day of Pentecost. Repenting, turning away from sin, a changed mind with changed behavior, and being baptized in water for the forgiveness of sins. We'd be glad to assist you in that today. Won't you come as we stand and as we sing together?